technology now. Great. Well, let's uh, let's kick this off. Um, we got 30 people here, so uh, good crowd. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, catching you at a, a good time, either early in the morning or late in the evening. Um, and yeah, the, we, we've had kind of talking to people in the TVM community. It's, it's come up again and again. To just it'd be nice to have a place to have higher bandwidth discussions in addition to the discuss forums. And and uh, as Ramana put up, you know, pointed out in the the discuss forum. You know, this is not designed to replace any RFC process or online discussion, and we want that all to continue. Uh, but this is just a way to augment those discussions and act as a kind of uh, catalyst and and uh, and accelerator of some of those, and, and also to still make these as widely accessible as possible through posting on YouTube and uh, recordings, etc. So with that, uh, I posted the the doc in the chat. Uh, feel free to make comments there. I made a few notes of. Uh, you know, feel free to drop comments about uh, various suggestions you have or on timing, format, et cetera. Uh, can you hear us? Uh, you know, these kind of things. Um, and uh, there's a few kind of uh, people have suggested some uh, open mic discussion points. So feel free to keep adding those as we uh, talk things through. And, 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 and there's also a, a call out of, you know, as you're going through this meeting, think of, is this useful for you? Uh, do you want this to happen again? What's your ideal frequency, et cetera? Or this can be just a one-off thing. Um, so be thinking that in mind and feel free to drop comments in the in, in, uh, comments on the doc there. And with that, I'll get out of the way and uh, leave the floor to Tianchi. Uh, Tianchi, you want to share your screen and uh, you shouldn't have any, I shouldn't need to pass anything to you. You just, just should just be able to go right ahead. Oh, and you're still muted, by the way. Can everybody hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's get started. So hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'm mainly going to use the brief 10 minutes to talk about the recent progress that we made. made. Oh, is Tianchi breaking up for me? Or is uh, is it just me? Or is, is, is that the same for everyone else as well? Uh, let's see. Sounds OK on my end. Okay for me. Okay, so okay for so, me. So we continue then. Jason, can you hear me fine? I think I have an audio receiving problem on my end. So why don't you go ahead, Tianchi? I'll fix this on okay. my side. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So today I'm going to briefly talk about the the progress we have made in the unified IR front. So uh, for those who have been watching the community, uh, you have known that you know we we have been working on this unified effort for about uh, five to six months now. And this is one of the major movements in the community to upgrade the compiler infrastructure to a more unified uh, design. And uh, to, to give you an overview of you know, what unified R is, the main goal of unified R is trying to unify all the aspects of the current compiler stack into a single more consistent design for end-to-end -end machine learning compiler. So traditionally, TVM have this two layer design where we have the relay as a high level input module that does graph optimizations. And we have a test expression layer and then low level IR layer that was orig originated from Halide. And then we started to evolve that. They were introduced at different time point and uh, they are kind of stitched together in a different stage way, which is totally fine. Um, however, as we start to working with all those IRs, we start to find that there's a chance to unify them so that it's a, there's a more consistent view. And uh, so, 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 to, so to, to give you a sense of what kind of like a unification we have made in unified IR, our goal is to have a single IR module where our module represents a collection of functions where that does uh, transformation and a unified path and transformation infrastructure that allows us to do things like, you know, we will have a single path manager that can be used in both relay and TIR. And um, one of the highlights that we'll have two variants of functions. So there's a TR prime function, which is a low level function that represents a low level test expression transformation, as well as the high level relay function. Um, the one of the important factor that glues this function variants together is the single type system. So the idea is that, you know, we want to be able to make sure that high level relay function to be able to call into the low level TR functions. And we can also introduce future function variants such as, for example, there are uh, cases where people want to hear uh, external functions from MIR, other cases. And in order for this function to call into each other, 
we will need to clearly define calling conventions and a single type system help us to basically uh, define that boundary so that you know we can use the function signature to define how we're going to call each functions and use that as a protocol for exposing the API boundary. And finally, we'll have a unified text format hybrid script. Um, so, so far we have a text format for really, but not, uh, but not necessarily uh, a bidirectional text format for uh, TIR and uh, that's gonna change. So as, uh, you know, as an overall organization, um, this is something that we have already landed in terms of like uh, code organizations in C++. So we can roughly categorize them into two categories. So they are on the left, there's more like a hierarchical compiler stack where each of the module corresponds into one stage in the compiler. So from the high level, we have a relay, which is a high level uh, functional program IR that allows us to do things like automatic differentiation and graph writing. And then there's a tense expression layer that helps us to define the concise computation of tensor expressions. TIR is this, uh, is this new layer of you know, evolved low level tensor level IR that help us to do things like more loop transformations and low level optimizations. Target is more like tar target specific lowering. And we have a common runtime that help us to run TVM programs on platforms like you know, uh, CPU, GPUs and embedded devices. On the right, uh, these are common compiler infrastructures that many of those compiler stack layers share. For example, the IR module is a common layer that, that defines the type system, the IR module, the pass function, and basic function, um, function based classes. Arithmetic is this uh, you know, symbolic integer simplification layer that helps us to do a bunch of uh, integer analysis so that you know, our, our lower expression can be concise that without many of the modular division operations. Notice our reflection module that uh, defines uh, uh, several components for reflection so that we can uh, effectively access those IR components in the Python, other front end languages and support its other supporting libraries. So uh, uh, one highlight I want to make is that, you know, most of the type system actually in the Unify are inherited from Relay. So they are kind of familiar and there's not a lot of changes in the Relay part. The mo one of the major movement that we've been making so far are uh, upgrading a low level TIR uh, module to make use of this Unify infrastructure. In particular, we are going to introduce, um, so originally in the low level IR, the, the transformation of, uh, inherited from Halide is this, you know, statement to statement transformation. So we have like, we will take a statement and we'll transform to a, that to a statement. And um, what we, we believe that there is more, uh, it's better to change that into a IR module to IR module transformation. And the basic element in the IR module low level is what we call prime functions or primitive functions. Um, the, the primitive function is not that different from the function that you can see in, in languages like C or C++. Basically, it will contain a function with signatures, and within the function, we can allocate memory. We'll be able to read and write into those memories. One of the particular highlight of the primitive function is that first of all, we have additional attributes so that we can we can you know annotate things like that no aliasing or what is the lower symbol final lower symbol that we want to have, and that attribute field is flexible. Second is that we will have what we call a buffer binding primitive. So. Um, if you are familiar with TVM, you, you will know that you know, the buffer binding primitive allows us to declare certain argument correspond to a symbolic buffer. And that serves both as a you know, declaration mechanism as well as a constraint expression mechanism. For example, in this case, actually we're expressing that uh, three buffers, A, A0, A1, and, and C share the same shape. So, so you can find that both all of them share the same shape, M and N, in all those three buffers. And when we lower that code in a low level, uh, what that will translate to uh, uh, several pieces of code that will load, that will populate the variables M and N, and also will check, for example, A zeros shape zero equals A one shape zero. So, so there are there are ways for both expressing the the argument constraints as well as the ways to declare those variables. One of the reason that why it's so important is that you know in many of the uh, low level optimizations, uh, many of the optimizations 
you know, uh, depend on those additional constraints, like you know, the shape is constant, or uh, the shape of one variable equals to another. And being able to express those constraints in a very natural way is, is very important. So if you try to express this information in traditional functions, you will translate that into things like load m from a shape field and another assertion, which is harder to actually recover those constraint information. Um, so uh, one of the ongoing work that we're working on is actually what we call hybrid module. So besides the text format you see in the, in the last slide, we also introduced a Python dialect variant that, that allows us to express the same subset of TIN really. So the idea is that you know, there will be two variants of text format. There will be a normal text format and a hybrid script variant of text format. And uh, there will also be a Python AST parser that's able to parse the hybrid script into the TIR. So in here, this is an example of matrix multiplication written in a hybrid script and it will be passed in, it can be passed back into the TIR lowering. So one of the vision that we have is we want to be able to build a Python first, um, use a friendly IR framework. That means that every stage of compilation, we will be able to print that piece of IR into either the text format or the Python hyperscript, and we'll be able to use Python to construct any IRs at any stage so that we can easily do quick testing and even use hyperscript to prototype operators. So this is something that have not yet landed and still work in progress. So um, uh, at last point, I want to quickly talk about what can Unified IR bring in addition to what we have so far, which are already have, we already have quite a few awesome features. So one of the interesting thing that Unified IR brings is what we call multi-stage model learning. So imagine that we want to ingest model say from TensorFlow to, to, to TBM. Um, traditionally, we will depend on, we will define what we call a converter that converts one variant of TensorFlow uh, definition, either it's graph definition or HLO to TVM. With the unified IR module, we'll be able to express, for example, uh, an external function variant that allows us to hold certain external function pieces so that we can make use multiple stage IRs from the original definition. For example, in case TensorFlow, what we can do is we can convert some part of a graph definition to relay and while leave some of the unrecognized part as what we call external function, then lower that into HLO and further convert HLO into the corresponding relay part. The advantage of multi-stage lowering that we can you know, convert most of the, all the important operators in a high level definition so that it preserves the high level semantics for optimization while still able to gain coverage by using the low level, lower level representations that are usually more fine grained and you know, it's easier to cover those operators. The second thing that we are quite excited about is that we want to build in multi-dimensional load and store in TRL. So originally there's like one dimensional load store and most of the operators are lower to one dimensional load store, but we start to see more and more need for you know, multi-dimensional load stores throughout the entire lowering stack. For example, they are uh, these are quite important for supporting tensor accelerators and some of the DSP instructions. Uh, third thing is the unified type system allows us to encode richer type system in a low level TRR. So really already support those richer type systems, but what's interesting is that you know, in low level, originally we are only able to support things like primitive data types and law pointers. But now we have richer type information to say that this is a floating pointer or uh, we are going to we are, we'll also be able to express things like arrays and other abstract data structure into the low level. And that's going to be very helpful for doing things like ADT a, a, a ahead of time compilation. And um, uh, lastly, we'll be able to unify all the transformations into a more simple primitive and be able to customize optimization pipeline so that we can register things like you know, a specific optimization pipeline for CUDA GPU or a specific uh, optimization pipeline for a customized accelerator without hacking too much into the current code base. So here's the timeline of you know, what, where we are so far. So uh, as we said, the Unified RRC started last December and we have been working on it for around six months. And a lot of progress have been made. For example, most of the code C++ and Python module organization are already updated to reflect the current, uh, the, uh, the design vision of Unified R. And, we have already migrated some of the TIR passes into the new path infrastructure. Moving forward, 
we are going to uh, working on things like adding more target registries uh, and bring bringing types and path contacts into the TensorIR, uh, in, into a low level TIR. And hopefully we'll get a first version ready around the summer time frame. So besides the TR, there are, I also want to briefly talk about several other interesting updates. So first thing is that I think two weeks ago, we started a major upgrade on the RPC infrastructure. The main goal is to eliminate the DL open requirements so that we can run the TVM on more devices, in particular those devices with restricted environment like you know, embedded or other cases. And with the new design, it's much easier to do things like you know, uh, develop the customized RPC session as well as doing things like multi hop, hop proxy so that we can connect to one server and then jump to another hop to connect to another server. Another fun piece is that we released, uh, we updated and released a web assembly, a web GPU backend, and there's a blog post about it. If you are interested, you should definitely go and check it out. And uh, it will be a very, there are a lot of interesting use cases around that direction. So with that, I would like to conclude and uh, should we take questions after everybody or should I take questions now? Yeah, if there's any questions, we, we have time in the schedule. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tianji. I have one question. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's about the multi-stage uh, model lowering. Uh, mm -hmm. You give an example of TensorFlow, yeah. uh, graph dev, and HL lowering. Yeah. So um, could you elaborate a little bit? Sounds very interesting, but I didn't get yeah. um, the purpose of doing that. So, you know, different IRs, so, so different levels of IRs have pros and cons, right? For example, for example, if we are lowering from, say, the graph depth, right? There, there are a lot more operators to cover. So, but on the other hand, the advantage of graph depth is the graph depth still have operators like conf 2 d or conf 3 d and, so, and these operators are more coarse grained right? So if you want to, if you can directly conf, convert conf 3 d into relays conf 3 d there are more chances that we can better optimize these operators. However, if you if you directly build a converter on a graph depth level, there's a problem because graph depth have a lot more operators. So so you have to write converters for a lot a lot of them, right? So the, um, but if you if you build the converter from the HO level, there are fewer operators because TensorFlow already lowered those high level conf three and conf two D into more fine grained primitives like you know scans and the filters and 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 reduce. But the problem of that level is that you know you no longer get information like conf 3D or conf 2D, so that you know maybe it's harder to perform those optimizations uh, that needs those high level information. So the idea of multi stage lowering is that you know we'll first convert as much as possible those high level op op operators we can cover into relay, but still you know squash those low level fragments as what we call external function in TVM. That, that, that are still in graph depth format. And then we will lower those graph depth format into HLO, which, which have fewer operators that we can, again, use the converter to convert from so that we gain coverage for those operators that, that are not necessarily the bottleneck, but we still get the performing operators converted correctly. Does that answer your question? Yes, it says, I get it. So, so what's the status of that? So currently I think there's, uh, I've seen in the, in the uh, discuss forum talking about HO lowering and there's no concrete action yet, but one of the things we want to do is in the Unify, I want to make the infrastructure easy to do that, that kind of lowering. So for example, uh, allow uh, external function definition being easily added to the IR module so that when you convert things into TVM, you can easily squash some of the component that you don't recognize as, as external function and, and convert that in a later stage. I see. I see. Yeah. So, so yeah, and, and, and the high level picture is that you want to bring the uh, tensor uh, flow graph, whether mm -hmm. it's in graph dev or already being loaded, the whole tensor flow graph into mm -hmm. uh, TVM. Then into, a, uh, into an external function of TVM. Yeah. Into, yes. And, 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 the, and the run that using the TVM runtime, right? It's not going back to tensor flow runtime. Well, we, we are, we are, the idea is we are going to ingest as much as possible so that, you know, the, basically, we want to be able to resent the graph dev function in TVM function, but eventually that's going to go away, right? Because the graph dev can be lowered to HLO, and HLO can be lowered, HLO can be further converted into TVM. And then you can co gen from that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Maybe one last quick question. 
If not, then uh, thank you, Tianchi, for that great uh, walkthrough. And now on the agenda, we have uh, Matthew Brookhart from OctoML to talk about some graph pattern matching, uh, pattern matching and rewriting capabilities. Take it away, Matthew. Okay. Uh, Tianchi, can you stop sharing so I can share? Oh, yes. Okay, can everyone see? Yes. Okay, awesome. Let me minimize the Zoom window. Uh, so yeah, thanks for inviting me to, to talk about this stuff. So this is a feature that was recently added to TVM. It went through the whole RFC process and we got a lot of really good feedback from the community. So thanks to everyone who has helped make this a better feature. And this was just merged about a week ago. So people are just barely starting to use it for real world applications and uh, we thought it'd be a good idea to, to get the motivation out there and give you an introduction to what's going on. Um, so in Relay, there are a lot of places where one might want to do something like find a set of operations in a graph and then transform it into something else. Uh, this kind of thing happens in the fusion passes, in the quantization passes, in the bring your own code gen passes for various accelerators. It happens a lot in lowering to VTA, for instance. Um, there are, VTA only supports certain collections of operations that have to be fused together. Um, and so currently in, in those passes, every single pass has some different variant of a way to identify operations and rewrite them. Uh, so what we're trying to do here is unify all of that into a single purpose, uh, to do a single multi-purpose pattern language for expressing patterns in the graph and then providing facilities for the user to manipulate them. So these are some examples of things you might see in those passes. We have just a dense, a single operation by itself with two inputs. We have a diamond pattern where the outputs of conf2d are used by a couple of element-wise operations and then added together. Um, and then this is on the right is a, is a more fuzzy pattern where you might have some number of element-wise operations in those branches. Um, so this is what the syntax for this new pattern language looks like. Uh, just to give you a, a brief overview of what's going on. This first line, we're finding the, the COM2D operation and we're calling it on wildcards. So something that matches anything. And then we're saying one path is calling ReLU on that COM2D and another path is calling leaky ReLU on that COM2D. And then the final result is we're adding those together. So that is this central, uh, the central graph. So COM2D, ReLU, leaky ReLU, and this dot down here is supposed to be an add. I've got a bug in my graphic, sorry. Um, so this is kind of the definition of the language. Um, when you create this is op thing, what you're doing is you're creating an expression pattern, which is wrapping the relay expression for the operation. Uh, wild cards are something that matches anything. We also have things like variables, call patterns. So when you do this call syntax uh, on two wild cards with the, the conf operation, that's creating a call that matches a call node. Tuples, duplicate items. Alt pattern is alternative, so you can say, pattern A or pattern B, wildcard matches anything. Type and attributes um, match types of operations or attributes on ops or call nodes or functions. Um, and then the dominator pattern is kind of an interesting one. So this is a kind of complicated example on the right here of what you can do in this kind of situation. So we created a convolution that can run on, it inputs or anything. And we've created a path that can be a element-wise operation called on something or any two things added together. And then we're saying a reduction has to be two things added together. And then the final pattern is a domination node. So it takes a parent, a path, and a child. And what this pattern does is it says, I have a path, I have a, I have a child that I can find. I can find two things added together. I can go up the tree and I can find something that matches the parent, you know, a convolution. And what I'm gonna assert is that everything in between those two nodes has to match this path function. So it has to be an element-wise operation or an addition. And 
every output of the parent, the convolution, has to be used in that path to the reduction. Uh, and that allows us to do things like this, where we're doing complex uh, fuzzy pattern matching on the graph. And this is really useful for things where, say, you've got a convolution and a bunch of element-wise operations, and you want to merge those into a single loop, say, for fusion. Or um, there are many places where, where you want to do this for accelerators, for instance. Uh, and then the pattern language provides three main ways to use those patterns. So this is an example for one of the unit tests. Uh, we're creating one of those uh, diamond patterns. We're creating the same graph and relay. And then we're asserting that we match uh, the, the path, the pattern matches the expression. So this is a, a simple way to check is a pattern and an expression the same thing. That API is used under the hood in things like rewriting. Um, so this is another example from the unit tests. We have created a batch norm in element-wise operations, uh, which so gamma, x minus mean, square root of variance, epsilon, beta, those are all wildcards. And then we're, we're wrapping that in this callback object. And what this rewrite pass will do is take some function, uh, find sections in the graph where, where it matches this pattern, and then it will rewrite that into a relay batch norm operation. And so you can, you can imagine doing much more complex things than this uh, with the pattern language. Define some complicated pattern. You have full control to take the matched outputs and you know, run whatever kinds of transformations you want on it, quantize it, et cetera. Uh, the last API that I want to mention is partitioning. And partitioning is kind of currently in flux. There's some good discussion going on and discuss about what exactly we want this to do. But the basic idea is you take a function and you take a pattern that matches something in that function. Uh, and what partition will do is it will take your pattern, extract it out of your previous module, wrap it in a function call, and, and put that function call into your call graph. And this is something we're trying to use right now to update the merge composite pass, for instance, which does this kind of thing uh, already. Uh, but with the pattern language, we can simplify a lot of how that analysis happens and automatically wrap it into things that later passes can understand. Uh, so moving forward, uh, very good ongoing discussion the last few days at that link. So we'll show these slides later. Uh, starting to look at simplifying some passes. Uh, this is obviously a new feature. It's uh, tested, but I'm sure there are edge cases out there that are not in the unit tests. And so if you run into a bug while trying to use it, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to support and try to fix bugs and extend the APIs to better fit use cases. So thanks so much. Great, thanks, Matthew. Uh, maybe time for one or two questions, if any. Otherwise, we'll uh, go ahead and move on. Uh, thanks, Matthew. And now we have another Matthew, Matthew Barrett from ARM to talk about ethos and integration using Bring Your Own Code Gen. Matthew, take it away. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, let me try and share this. Uh... Yes, we can see that. Let me see if it. that worked? Perfect. Yes. Cool. Um, okay. Well, I've skipped the intro slide, but that's fine. Um, so hi, I'm Matthew. I'm uh, from the TVM team at ARM. And we've been working on integrating uh, our Ethos N NPU into the TVM uh, compiler stack. So quick introduction to what the Ethos N NPU is. It's, uh, it's an accelerator for machine learning. Um, it's an inference only accelerator, so it's not necessarily uh, interested in training. Uh, it's interested in quantized networks only. And it accelerates sort of whole operations. So for instance, it accelerates a conv2D or a max pool. Um, and because of these characteristics, it, it seemed like a natural fit to integrate at the relay level. 
and the bring your own code and infrastructure was targeting that sort of thing. So we uh, took the integration down that route. Um, so there's three variants of the Ethos and MPU, 77, 57, and 37, and they're all uh, optimized for different sort of workloads and devices. Um, so we uh, we already have a compiler for the, uh, the Ethos and MPUs um, called Support Library. And that takes a network to find in sort of its own graph API and will compile that network down to uh, a binary artifact. That's a, a command stream and that drives the NPU. Um, so that command stream can be given to the, the, uh, the driver and then that will run the inference for the network that, that you compiled. So what are our objectives in integrating this? Well, four main priorities. We want to see a relay graph and then determine which parts of that graph we can run on the MPU and split them into partitions just for the MPU. We then want to take those partitions, which contain now exclusively operators supported by the MPU and convert them into support libraries representation uh, using its graph API. Then we want to compile that to get the command stream, serialize that, and then put that into a runtime module so we can load it up in a runtime, pass it off to the driver and perform an inference. So that's what we're trying to achieve. And the bring your own code gen infrastructure is uh, how we got there. So very high level here, but in general, what we're doing is we're taking a TF light model um, in particular, we're looking at the QNN dialect, so the quantized dialect. Um, we're lowering that TF light model down to a relay IR module. Then there's some graph partitioning steps in the bring your own code gen to get rid of all the stuff in that module that we can't support and just look at the stuff we can. We then want to take that, compile it, and give it to the runtime. So I'm just going to brief, briefly talk through some of those steps. So uh, one interesting thing about the TF Lite front end that we found out pretty quickly is that for quantized models, it's not really the case that a TF Lite convolution goes down to a relay convolution. It actually gets partially lowered in that step. So we see here uh, a conv2d gets uh, spit out into these four operators, a uh, pad, QNN Conv2D by Assad and Requantize. Now, individually, um, our accelerator doesn't support those operators, but as a, as a sequence of four, it does. So we need to be able to kind of reconstruct that operator from the relay. Um, and this is where Merge Composite came in. So um, we suggested this early in January uh, and uh, you'll have heard uh, Matthew talk about this previously, but this was essentially a pattern matching pass where we found those sequences of operators that represent something we can sort of intrinsically support on the MPU. And we fold them into a function that we can easily identify. So we're hoping that this will be migrated to the new pattern matching infrastructure, um, but just as a quick uh, visualization of of what it does. Um, we have the initial graph, which has all of these operators in. We match the pattern, and it will wrap the sequence that corresponds to the operator we're interested in, in what we refer to as a composite function. So that's a function with a composite attribute equal to the name of, of whatever you want. So in this case, maybe QNN conv 2 d pad, because it's a pad is quantized convolution. This is very useful because now we can really easily identify where there's something that we support and easily code gen the right thing for that. Um, so next, there's the annotate target step. Um, this is the part which basically labels the graph with, you know, this is supported by ethosn or this isn't supported. Um, and to do this, we need to do, we need to inform the part of one further thing. We need to tell it what individual operators we support. So even though in the case of convolution, it's a composite operator for things like max pool or QNN add, it is the case that we have a more or less one-to-one -one mapping. 
And uh, we do this by registering um, uh, sort of a, an attribute to the operator target.ethosn. Uh, but in general, that's target dot your external code gen. So once we've run annotate target, we have uh, a nicely annotated graph telling us what bits can go where. Um, we then had to introduce this do pass merge compiler regions. So this pass is there to take it from where we are before this, which is individual operators. We know whether or not they're supported to knowing what contiguous regions of the graph are supported. Um, so you might not need to do this in uh, some traditional libraries where it's just a case of, okay, I have a convolution and I want to in call this convolution function in a library. Um, but because our compiler support library does interoperator optimizations, it doesn't just want to know about the operator, it wants to know about its context in the graph. So we want to merge together the supported operators to get the largest contiguous region possible. And um, that's what's done in this pass. There's some subtleties towards doing this without creating cyclical data dependencies, but uh, they seem to be ironed out now. Um, so after that, there's the graph partitioning step, which basically we know what regions we want to partition off, and this does the mechanical bit of partitioning them. So it takes the supported regions, um, brings them into global scope as a global function, and names them something like ethos dash n zero or dash one, and you have as many of them as you have partitions. So once we've got all that, we can get to the point where we actually are code genning. So we receive in our code gen passes an IR module that just contains global functions which are ethos supported global functions. Um, we then run two passes on those global functions. So the first one infers some more type information about quantization parameters. Uh, we need to do that because in support library, the quantization parameters are part of the type of tensors. Um, so not just the data type and the size, but also uh, the zero point and the scale. Once we have that information though, we can uh, have another pass through the graph and this is just doing a conversion of either an operator or a composite function to its equivalent um, support library ethos n operation. Uh, so this is where the bulk of our changes actually are. Um, up until now, it's, it's been mostly upstream infrastructure and we're just integrating with it by putting in that table of what is and isn't supported. Um, but this is where uh, the big changes actually come in. Um, so once we actually have this code gen, um, we're going to uh, get a compiled object and serialize that to the disk. Then the final step, um, we have a custom runtime module. So this is an ethos n runtime module. And it's designed to essentially pick up that serialized blob of command stream and run it by putting it through the, for the driver. Uh, a, an important thing to note here is that the serialized command stream doesn't live on disk in its own right. It gets embedded into the, uh, the host.so file which will also contain the um, CPU code, for instance, for any stuff that wasn't offloaded. Uh, so that's the brief, a very brief um, introduction to what we've done. Uh, just as a few comments um, on, on, on using it, I think the bring your own code gen infrastructure is now in a, in a really good state. Um, you actually don't need to make that many changes to integrate with it. It's mostly defining that, uh, that table and that set of things which say this is supported, this isn't supported. Um, and I'd like to uh, say a big thanks to everyone who's worked on bring your own code and infrastructure because it's made our life a lot easier. And um, it's, it's looking like now it's working really well. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there's any questions, but. Well, thank you, Matthew. And, and thanks for using uh, bring your own code and, and 
uh, building out functionality based on that. Uh, yeah, any questions? Nope. Okay. Great. And uh, yeah, Matthew, if if you if if you can share these slides, uh, feel free to uh, post the link in the agenda doc or send it to me, and I can do that. Um, and now we can move to open mic. Um, yeah. So for for this section, it's it's. Uh, I don't have a, a clear format. I kind of listed some ideas here. I was thinking if if you do have suggestions for future meeting topics, um, if you are feeling adventurous and, and really passionate, um, you know, feel free to take the floor and, and uh, mention them out here. Otherwise, we can just talk on the discuss thread uh, or feel free to make a new one or use one of the existing um, TVM online uh, meetup threads. Yeah, anyone, anyone have any impassioned pleas for uh, future meeting topics, or was this useful for you? Um, we've had kind of a, a suggestion of doing a GPU birds of a feather type session for anyone interested in adding GPU support as an example. The floor is open. Everyone's a bit shy this morning. Mm -hmm. If not, we can uh, we can move on. Hello? Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I have a question. So I was wondering, um, bit in the topic uh, related to bare metal systems. Um, I know there is already some some efforts uh, going on in terms of you know Misra and bringing um, the t t t TVM to to the system where where we don't have any operating system. So I was wondering, you know, if uh, that would be an interesting topic for, for a future meetup or also maybe uh, if you could comment on what's the progress there. I don't know if, if anybody involved in this effort is in the call right now. So uh, I was wondering if, I don't know, if you can comment on that. Yeah, great, great topic. Uh, we we are on, on the um, OctoML side publishing a blog post uh, with, with the latest up-to-date set of um, benchmark numbers and, and walkthroughs and, and open tutorials, uh, GitHub repo uh, associated with the PR changes that Andrew Roche has been pushing in. Uh, so that should, we're actually shooting for end of this week uh, for pushing that out. And, and then yeah, birds of a feather session would be great to discuss that and bring in anyone else who wants to discuss. Yeah, and uh, we know that, you know, there are also community works. Uh, so James mentioned like OctoML side, they also like Binaro, I think Tom is on the core and then uh, um, and then, you know, um, there's also um, the Misra C runtime, it's from AWS Shanghai. And so, so like there are quite a few interesting collaborative effort on the, on the, and there are also like ARM folks working on Codex A support. So there are a lot of like interesting embedded TVM and perhaps that would be an interesting topic that we can bring in the future. Another thing that would be interesting is that, you know, given that, uh, the online meetup is more like community event. So if any of any of you or your organization is interested in hosting a version of the of the meetup, you you are more than welcome to to you know propose that we can we can start to talk about the potential meetup plan. Yeah. Yeah. Great question or uh, suggestion, Miguel. Any, any others? If not, let's uh, let, let's someone put on uh, or Landra put on Python package versioning. Landra, do you want to describe what your uh, your quick question was or, or thought here? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's more like a, I think a, a heads up of something we uh, we want to submit a quick uh, kind of an RFC soon. Um, it's based kind of on the, of the motivation that uh, one of the barriers that people have when kind of they are learn they are new to TVM, and they want just to experiment with. Yeah. One of the things that they cannot do today is kind of just do kind of pip install TVM and then start playing and, and doing some, some of this. Uh, and I guess we, st we still need to sort of sort some things before having that kind of as a routine uh, uh, packet uh, Python packages to publish. And one of the things is the, how to deal with versioning, because at the moment, if you generate a package, you only will get some 
static version from a couple files that we have yep. in the repository. And if you are going to generate a release, you, you probably need to go there and edit those files. And I guess as a, as a more generic uh, project thing, we would need to commit those files and then we would have a version generated with that uh, specific kind of uh, version tag. Uh, so we feel that there are some kind of uh, good practices that other projects have that we could bring on into a TDM and, in, and that would allow us to generate packages that would, would self-identify saying that this is a release or this is some development version based on this kind of git hash or at this stage in the code. So it would be easier uh, in a way to identify your packages and easy to distribute to people. So just more like a heads up of something. Uh, it would be important to have a discussion and an RFC to see whether it doesn't break somebody else's uh, workflow. Uh, but we think kind of this is a, a positive change to, to make. Yeah, I think uh, the PIP packaging is definitely on our 0 0.7 roadmap. So that is something that uh, we're, we're, we're definitely interested in hearing about. Um, what, one of the things we need to, uh, uh, we, I want to say here is that, you know, because of Apache policy, our policy is that, you know, officially we only release the source packages. So, but, but on the other hand, uh, the community can maintain and, 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 you know, release binary packages as long as we have a disclaimer that, you know, it's not an official Apache release. So there are, there are some legal implications here, but uh, uh, it's, it's doable as long as we, we keep maintaining a community version of the, of the binary release. Yep. Oh, okay. I wasn't aware that, that it was kind of uh, intentionally not, not published. Okay. That's quite fine. Yeah. Yeah, and also want to just comment on the uh, GPU bottle of session ideas. So, um, you know, we've been uh, looking at the GPU uh, code generation from the potential expression, and we're also watching the, the, the topics being discussed on TVM forum. So we wonder whether there is a, a high bandwidth um, place that we can have a, a more uh, intensive discussion on a few topics. Uh, that's the, 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 I think that one of the ideas of having this uh, uh, online kind of meetup, I just bring in um, all the people that who are interested in the GPU, how to, uh, especially in the tensor expression part, and the, uh, go through the problems and challenges that uh, um, we are facing and the list of questions. So um, sometimes we find that uh, this kind of high, 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 high bandwidth discussions is needed to make forward progress. Um, as um, uh, one of the items listed here is talk about the thread binding. So we, we bring this up, just want to bring up the, to, the, to the attention of this community. So uh, we have these questions, but we do want to see whether we can have a, a more uh, active discussion on topics like this. Any comments? Yeah, I would say uh, I would take that as it sounds like you're thumbs upping plus wanting the GPU birds of feathers, yeah. thing, uh, which which sounds great. Uh, I think that's exactly what these forums are good for. Yeah, so so wonder that whether that we can we can uh, open a uh, maybe a thread discussion on TVM forum to collect uh, the topics that uh, people are interested in, especially for the TPU or the GPU for text expression. Yeah, that sounds great. Johan, can you uh, go and create that thread and, and drive that? Yeah, we can do that. OK, yeah. great. And I'm happy to, uh, on the OctoML side, happy to host the Zoom meeting if, if that's helpful <laughs> as a result uh -huh. of that, or uh, whoever else wants to uh, yeah. just putting that out there. All right. Okay. Great. And, and Landra, just uh, on your last comment, um, I, as a TVM you know, community member, um, not officially, perhaps, but as, a, as someone who you know, follows the TVM community, I uh, I would like to see TVM packaging, and and as Tianxi mentioned, it's on the roadmap. So um, you know, don't take that to mean that it's it's not desired. So I I look forward to seeing your RFC yeah. uh, if you put that out there. Great, just want to make sure that clear. Uh, we yeah. have about it's... oh yeah, go ahead. What was that? 
Oh, maybe just sprays. Uh, so we have about eight minutes left. Uh, someone had the idea. I think it might have been uh, Young Feng, uh, if I remember correctly. I, I uh, accepted the comments. So I lost the name, but uh, to to have open office hours and uh, specifically posted this one um, binding to Itervars on a loop nest thread. Uh, would it be useful for people to you know go through these things? And and does anyone have any comments? Have have they looked at this already? Or Young Feng, or was that you or? Um, You're muted if you're if you're there. Yeah, it's, it, it 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 is from Yonfan. I think he's muted right now. Okay. Yeah. So um, maybe that uh, uh, given this uh, the group may may not be a good idea to uh, discuss because it does involve lots of uh, details. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But just sorry, I was to... muted. Okay, Yonfan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but. I mean, I think so we still have like seven minutes left and that's the only question. So I still want to bring it up and hopefully get some attention and the comments from Tianqi or whoever has um, uh, insight of uh, this kind of questions. We can take offline for further discussion. Is that good? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Um, so during the last um, conference, we showed a, uh, a document uh, about operational model, and we want to build up a model to describe uh, the scheduling parts. And uh, the unified AI, I guess that won't change. That part won't change the scheduling, how we schedule on the, the tasks among threads or among individual modules. And over here, I have a doubt, and uh, so I want to clarify that. Um, my understanding is. Our schedule basically is a tree structure, and uh, every iteration is a node. I mean, every iteration interval or roof nest is just a node in the tree structure, and we go deep along the um, the roof nest. Basically, we just go over on this this uh, tree structure, and which means every node should appear only once. So. Um, thread binding is a HY to me. It's just basically eventually becomes a uh, launch bound, but it's still an HY on the boundary somewhere. But if there are two HYs on one path go along this nest, that makes it no longer a tree. I'm not sure if that is clear, right? Just imagine a tree, or if you look at on the thread, you can see I draw a tree over there. So that's the point I want to clarify whether tree is sufficient. I mean, for the use cases, I find tree should be sufficient. Although I find a case we have to do whatever TM is implemented today, but I also show a alternative way to model it, but it's still within a structure of tree. So that's the, uh, the, the fundamental question, but we can go through more details on that. Yeah, I think this is an excellent question. And, and this is a question that we are also actually thinking about in TBI in particular, whether, you know, how do you model threading, which is very, it's kind of like different from the looping behavior, right? Because in threading, what you will do is you have an environment thread and then that thread can be bonded into multiple places. And uh, if you have things like a, a reduction loop, uh, and uh, sometimes it's, uh, you will, you will in the current TVM at least, we will have a situation where you have an outer thread binds to the binds to the to the same thread, and there's an internal loop that also binds to the same thread. However, okay. the the rule so far is that you want you want basically these two bindings to to operate independently, right? So you don't want to it, it it's not although there's a nesting structure, the intention is not nesting. The intention is you have a thread that works on one stage and thread work on another stage. So uh, we are open to alternatives to on clarifying this concept. I think it's very important to clarify that and agree that the current behavior, well, the way that we work around it in the current behavior is that we simply say that if there's uh, two thread bindings on the same nest, you ignore the inner version in code yeah. rolling, but that will sometimes, you know, that, that will result in correct code. So so if you have any ideas on, you know, clarifying that and propose alternative basically conceptual models on, mm -hmm. on that, I think it would be very helpful. But but I think it's something that, that's special about GPU. And uh, and it's uh, it's a very important concept that uh, the sound, for example, the current 
models like the polyhedral model, other model may not handle well because you know some somehow we don't we cannot directly model it as a simple loop nesting or like at least we need to make some extensions to the to the loop nesting model to to think about this thread body structure. Okay, yeah, yeah, I think I I, I got on the point. I have the same feeling. Yeah. My yeah. understanding, I mean, my one interpretation here is we still want to do on uh, the free scheduling along each interval, each loop, but mm -hmm. thread binding, it just give a constraint on top of that. So certain I see, yeah. groups have to run together. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that, that, that that's good. Can, uh, I'll follow up. So hopefully you can comment on something. I can give more detail on the thread. Sounds good. And, uh, yeah, I think that, that that's very good. Great, and thanks for the suggestion, Yang Feng, on, on the office hours idea. Well, with that, uh, that's uh, all the we have on the agenda. Um, thanks so much for attending, and uh, yeah, feel free again to give any feedback on the docs in the form of comments or the discuss forum. And look forward to seeing your posts, Yuan, on the GPU birds of a feather session ideas. And um, uh, hopefully, this was useful and, and maybe the first of many. So thanks again. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.